I'm going to read from Acts chapter number 7, verse 37. Last Sunday night, we talked about biblical ignorance. I hope you'll take the time to listen or watch that message on sermon audio on your iPhone, your iPod, iPad, smartphone, Android device, home computer. We're going to try to combat biblical ignorance again today. It's called the teaching of God's word. Verse 37, chapter 7, the book of Acts. Hear the word of the Lord. This, this is that Moses. What Moses? This Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, notice now please, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall you hear. Notice in particular, this man is a prophet. He is a spokesperson for God. He speaks the words of the Lord. Notice, please, that this man is raised up by God. He is, in fact, an Israelite. He's of, prepositional phrase, of your brethren. And notice, please, he is like Moses. This man is like Moses. And finally, him shall you hear. Him shall you hearken unto. Him shall you obey. Him shall you listen to. Let's pray. Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and minds to be attentive. May we just absolutely be attentive to your word today and May the distractions of digital devices be eliminated and our focus be on you and your word in particular. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ask the question, why? Why did God raise up Moses? Stephen, speaking to the Sanhedrin here, to the council, is making a particular reference to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. If you don't have that in your Bible, take the time now with your pen and write in the white place next to the word, verse 37, Deuteronomy chapter number 18, verse 15. Deuteronomy, D-E-U-T, period 18, colon. 15, Deuteronomy 18, 15. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you. Israel's going to get another prophet. God's going to raise up another Moses-like prophet. He will be a true Israelite. He will be like Moses. And God expects Israelites to listen to this prophet. Him shall you hear. Why did God raise up Moses? What was Moses' purpose in life? Moses' purpose was to bring God glory by delivering his people from bondage in Egypt by means of many signs and wonders, and then to lead them to the promised land in Canaan. That was Moses' purpose. He had a particular calling from God to do just this. In verse 37, Stephen is quoting from Deuteronomy 18.15. So take the time now to turn back to Deuteronomy 18. We're going to look at all four or five verses there. Turn back to the Torah or the first five books of your Old Testament. Find Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And let's find chapter number 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. The goal this morning is so that when someone says to you, what the preacher preach about, you could kind of say more than Jesus. Yeah, a little bit more than that, that there may be some retention that occurs. 
Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. Let's look at the first section. The Lord, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren. And this prophet will be like Moses. And then he says, unto him shall you hearken. You, you need to figure out, number one, who is this prophet? And then once you identify who this prophet is, make it your mission in life to listen to him. Right. Him shall you hearken. Him, to him, unto him shall you hearken. Verse 16, according as to all that thou desirest, according to all that thou desirest. Of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me this great fire any more that I die not. Do you remember that? This is where the Israelites said, Don't talk to us anymore, God. Talk to us through a mediator. We, that's too much. Hearing directly from God is too much. And so God says, Okay, if that's what you want, I'll give you a prophet. I'll give you a prophet. And from now on, I'll speak to you through a prophet. And the Lord said unto them in verse 17, they have spoken well that which they have spoken. I will raise up a prophet from among their brethren. He'll be like Moses, like unto thee. And this is what God said. I'm going to put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Verse 19. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not, so anyone that does not hearken unto the words of this prophet, the ones that the prophet speaks in God's name, notice please, I will require it of him. Underline the words, I will require it of him. Underline, I will require it of him. So number one, we need to figure out who is this prophet? Because if God is going to hold me responsible for whether I listen to the prophet, I need to know who is he. God, you want me to listen to a prophet? Tell me who that prophet is. Because you're going to hold me responsible for my failure to listen to this prophet. So I better, number one, figure out who it is. We said a long time ago that there are three fundamental questions. Uh, is there a God? Number one. Does the God communicate? Number two. And if he does communicate, where is this communication found? Did we not say those three things? We answer, yes, there is a God. Yes, he does communicate. And we believe as Christians that the communication is bound up in this book we call the, tell me church, the Bible, the Bible. So now we're reading from God's book and in this book he tells us, I am going to send you another prophet. I'm going to send you another prophet. We want to know who is that prophet. Who is the prophet? Who is the fulfillment? Jews, Jews suggest that it is Joshua. This is not doing anything. My little, nope, I guess it's dead. Uh, Joshua or one to come. Muslims, Pastor Bill, argue that it's not Jesus, that it is Muhammad, Muhammad. It's Muhammad. It's not Jesus. It's Muhammad, that he is the Deuteronomy 18, 15 promise. Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons are arguing a dual fulfillment, that yes, it was in fact Jesus, but because of his inability to get everything right with his followers and keep it going, that God had to send up another Deuteronomy 18, 15 prophets. So is it, is it Joshua? Is it Muhammad? Is it Joseph and Jesus? I mean, who is the Deuteronomy 18, 15 prophets? So you're going to argue that it's Christ, and I'm going to agree with you. In fact, I'm going to set down my preacher hat, and I'm going to take on the uh, hat of an attorney. And for the rest of the time together, my goal is to convince you, my audience, a, a group of jurors, that it is in fact Jesus. That he is a prophet, that he is like Moses, and that because he is most like Moses, you should be fully convinced that's him. Because you got to decide. You got to decide it was Joshua. It's Joshua. It's yet to come. It's Jesus. It's Muhammad. It's Joseph Smith. 
Why, why do I need to decide? Don't press me to decide. Don't tell me anything. Okay, you don't have to, but be in mind, if you choose not to listen to him, you'll have to answer for that at the judgment day. You'll have to answer it. Because it very clearly says, I'm going to require it of you. I'm going to require it of you. So you will not, having now been here this morning, unless you get up and run out the door right now, you will not say, I had no idea that there was a prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 that required that I listen to somebody. You won't be able to say that. That's right. So you'll have the answer of, I chose another prophet. I chose another prophet. That prophet could be yourself. It could be Joseph Smith. It could be Muhammad. You, you follow your own self. That's, that's the height of idolatry. You, you're, you're your own prophet. I listen to myself. But somebody is the Deuteronomy 18, 15 prophet. Somebody is. The um, Mormons... We're going to argue that an Old Testament passage that the saints were initially reluctant to interpret as a reference to Joseph Smith is the prophecy attributed to Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him shall you hearken. The image of a prophet being raised up who would be like unto Moses certainly fits Joseph Smith, to which I would argue absolutely, positively, no, 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 no. Interpreting this prophet as Joseph Smith was initially seen as problematic since the New Testament clearly identifies the prophet in the passage such as Acts chapter 3 as Jesus. An identification that is reinforced but in the book of Mormon and Moroni. Did I pronounce that incorrectly? I want to think moron is what I want to think whenever I see that, but I know it's not that. More recently, LDS scholars have deemed it appropriate to invoke the principle of dual fulfillment. Dual fulfillment, that's very convenient. Dual fulfillment. A BUI, Brigham Young University religion professor, Frank Jude writes, Moses' prophecy has dual fulfillment. Jesus Christ and Joseph Smith. Okay, what, what do we say to that? What, what, how would we argue intelligently? My goal this morning is to equip you. To equip you. To give you a legitimate understanding of what Deuteronomy 18, 15 is all about so that you can intelligently argue why Jesus is the Deuteronomy 18, 15 prophet. Peter writing in Acts chapter 3 says, and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. So Peter thinks it's Jesus Christ whom the heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, now here is Peter quoting again from where church? All right, we're going to remember stuff a lot better if we do several things. Number one, we write it down. Number two, we speak it. All right, so where are we quoting from? Deuteronomy 18, 15. Is it your desire to learn a little bit of the Bible today? Would that be okay if you learned a little bit of the Bible today? Would that, would that be all right? If your level of biblical intelligence kind of went up just a little bit because of this sermon. Would that, you're all right with that? All right, very good. So we're trying to understand who is the Deuteronomy 18, 15 prophet. Because Moses truly said unto the fathers, the ancients, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things. Whatsoever he shall say unto you, it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, now that ought to scare you. That soul is going to be destroyed destroyed. So you're now on notice right now that if you choose to ignore the prophet that Deuteronomy 18, 15 prophesies of, that your soul will be destroyed. All right, that's not good. Your soul being destroyed is not good. You'll not be thankful that your stroll was destroyed. So Peter is fully convinced that the Deuteronomy 18, 15 prophet is Jesus of Nazareth. And by the way, so is Stephen in Acts chapter 7. So I wonder what event would have had a profound impact on Peter to lead him to the conclusion that Jesus is clearly the Deuteronomy 18, 15 prophecy. I'm going to argue with you that it's the Mount of Transfiguration experience. Do you remember what happens? Mount of Transfiguration. You should know this story. This is a common biblical story. It's like the baptism of Jesus. It's at that level of importance. Peter, James, and John are gathered or selected by Jesus, only three of them, to go up to this mount. 
And at that mount, Moses and Elijah show up. It's pretty amazing. Moses and Elijah, yeah, they're dead, but they show up showing us that there is a resurrection. And they show up. So now we have Peter, James, and John, and we have Jesus and Moses and Elijah up on the mount. All, all of them there, six of them there. Peter wants to hang out. He wants to stay there. Let's enjoy this, build some tabernacles and chill out up on the mountain. This is really cool. Moses and Elijah disappear, and then a voice is heard from heaven, and the voice says, listen to my son. So, so you get the Moses connection because he shows up, and then so that you're absolutely clear as to who it is, they disappear, leaving only Jesus in a glorified or transfigured or amazing appearance. And Peter hears a voice. Remember, God said he spoke from heaven. A voice speaks from heaven and says, you listen to him. So this is where I, as an attorney, turn to the attorney arguing that Muhammad is the one, and I say, when did your character have this type of an experience? Right. Remember, I am an apologist for the Christian faith. I don't have a bumper sticker on my truck that says coexist. I don't believe in coexist. I am an unabashedly an evangelical fundamentalist, okay? I'm a radical in my faith. My faith demands that I'm a radical. It's not optional. Either Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father but by me, or he's a liar. There's no middle ground. There's no wiggle ground. But you said to me, but Pastor Sean, my Muslim friends are great neighbors. My Mormon friends are amazing neighbors. To which I say to you, if they're so amazing, evangelize them. Amen. Amen. Bring them to Christ. Bring them to Christ. Share with them Deuteronomy 18, 15. Take them to this sermon. Show them that Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18, 15. Cause them, ask them, examine your faith. Show me how Joseph Smith is this and not Jesus. Show me how Muhammad is this and not Jesus. Because I can show you how Jesus is this prophet. There is no wiggle room in I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's none. We might want to create wiggle room because it's difficult to us to imagine how our awesome co-workers are going to hell. Look, some of the best soldiers I had in the army were LDS. That doesn't mean that the entire thing is legitimized because of their work ethic. We have to examine their belief system. And today, we are arguing that when God said, this is my beloved son, hear you him, hear him, that this was a fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. So Pastor Sean, do you have any other evidence besides that one anecdotal episode from Luke? Yes, I do. Let's get started. Let's start with the, Deut uh, the genealogies. Steve, Ma Matthew 1, Luke 3. That's where our two genealogies are. In both cases, the author goes out of his way to make sure that you understand that Jesus is a descendant of Jacob. Now, typically, they'll run to Abraham. But I want you to understand that we are going to go even more specific. We're going to go to Jacob. We're going to argue that like Moses, Jesus is a son of Israel. He's a son of Jacob. And he is a son of Isaac, not Ishmael. Right. Not Ishmael. Moses traces his lineage back to Abraham through Isaac. Muhammad attempts to trace his lineage, attempts to trace his lineage back to Abraham through Ishmael. A true Israelite is a son of Isaac, not Ishmael. Isaac was the child of promise. But wait a minute, it's not just Isaac. It also has to be Jacob because Esau sold the birthright. So the only legitimate descendancy that you can be a, um, a prophet like Moses is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Joseph Smith, where can you show me that you're a son of Isaac or a son of Jacob? And of course, it's ridiculous. He's not. 
He's not. Neither is Muhammad. Neither is Muhammad. Moses is the main character of the Old Testament. Jesus is the main character of the New Testament. When Moses was born, uh, a pharaoh, an evil king, was ruling over the Jews. When Jesus was born, Herod, a great, uh, Herod the Great, an evil king, was ruling over the Jews. Like Moses, Jesus' life was saved in Egypt. Do you remember that? Two went a trip down to Egypt and his life was saved. Like Moses, Jesus had an adopted father after leaving his father in heaven. Pharaoh left his biological father, had a, pharaoh, uh, a father in the palace. Moses forsook the glories of a palace to do the will of God. Jesus Jesus forsook the glories of heaven to do the will of God. Moses fled to the wilderness. The Holy Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness. Remember, what are you arguing right now, Pastor Sean? Why are you taking us through this long list and boring us to death with all these facts? The prophet had to be like Moses. He had to be like Moses. Not like Moses, he's a male, and not like Moses, uh, uh, he's white. Not, that, that's not what we're talking about. No, like his actions, what he does, his environment, his raising up, that the biblical stories are going to line up. Now, here I am as an attorney. The more I present to you, the greater you should be what? Convinced. Convinced. My objective is to convince you beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the most like Moses. Amen. When I'm done, an imam comes in and he presents his case. An LDS worker comes in and pre prevents his case. The reality is there isn't a case. There legitimately isn't a case. Like Moses, Jesus' brothers rejected him. We learned about that last week, and Jesus' brothers rejected him. Like Moses, Jesus is the great shepherd, John chapter 10, and Moses was a shepherd. Both receive a Gentile bride, Zipporah for Moses, the church for Jesus. Like Moses, Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, Exodus 34, Matthew 4. Moses performed amazing miracles. Jesus performed uber amazing miracles. Moses parts the water so he can walk on dry ground. Jesus says, I don't need to part the water. I'll just walk on the water. <laughs> Muhammad, when did you walk on water? Joseph Smith, when did you walk on water? Muhammad, when did you part water? Joseph Smith, when did you part water? Hey, hey, we're not being expected to believe something stupid. This is an intelligent faith. It's a supernatural intelligent faith, but it is nevertheless an intelligent faith. I was reading on Encyclopedia this week, Encyclopedia Britannica website. It's very hard to find objective information on the internet about Muhammad. It's very hard. It all seems to be sugar-coated. It's like the world has fallen in love with the Islamic faith, and I don't understand that. In fact, I don't understand why the liberal media has fallen in love with something that they would utterly eliminate if they had their way. Exactly. They don't have free speech in true Muslim nations. And ISIS has its way. You will not have CBS, NBC, Fox News, CNN, C-SPAN. All that will be eliminated. And yet, to find objective information on the internet about Muhammad is very difficult. I was reading in Encyclopedia Britannica's website that they believe, uh, that they, they, they communicate a story about Muhammad. They believe that sometime during his life, two angels met him. They met him and sliced his heart open. They sliced his heart open and cleansed his heart with a bowl of snow. That's how he became a pure man. His heart was cleansed with snow. They're not saying that in a symbolic way. Do you understand? Like we say the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now we don't mean that we get a blood bath in Jesus' uh, um, blood and it washes sin away. We believe that when we say the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, that our sin was paid for on a cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin for us. We're not saying some bizarre, ridiculous idea. We're saying in the economy of God, our sin is is paid for by a substitute. 
They're suggesting that a heart was cut open and snow in a golden basin was used to wash his heart. And do you believe that? It's absurd. It's absurd. And, and we need to be intelligent about this. Moses turned water to blood. Jesus turned water to wine. Like Moses, Jesus secured the release of his people from slavery. Slavery to sin is what Paul says. Paul says that we were slaves to sin. We were slaves to sin. How about this one? I don't have a slide for it. I thought about it this morning. Exodus chapter 17. Do you remember when the Israelites are fighting against the Amalekites? Do you remember that? They're fighting against the Amalekites. It's Exodus 17. And do you remember Moses is up on a high ground? And if he lifts his what? He lifts his what? His arms up. What happens? They're victorious, aren't they? And then as soon as arms go down, they begin to lose. And then arms go up and they're victorious. And arms go down. Do you think that was an accident? Or was that a picture of Jesus' outstretched arms? I need you to understand, church, that every jot and tittle in your Bible was intentionally put there by a God who wants to make sure that you clearly understand the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's not an accident. Okay? It's designed to inform an intelligent soldier like yourselves so that you will embrace Christianity because you see that this could not have been orchestrated other than a God to do this. Five connection points, six connection points, but I'm going to show you 30. It's easy to come up with a couple, but 30, 30 consistent connection points? Let's continue. I've got a few more for you. Some have argued on the internet that Jesus cannot be the Moses-like, the Moses-like prophet because he did not give his people a law. Moses gave them a law on Mount Sinai. Okay, but Jesus gave us a law. Paul calls it the law of Christ in Galatians 6 2. The law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? It's Mark chapter 12, verse 29 through 31. The Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and being. And the second is like unto the first, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. All the commandments. This is it. He gave him a new law. James calls it the royal law. He calls it the royal law. That's a great name for it. The royal law. Why? It's given to us by a king. You'd expect a law that a king gives to be called a royal law. Israelites live by the law of Moses. We live by the law of Christ. That's why we're here on Sunday and not Sabbath. That's why we're not sacrificing. That's why we have mixed fabric. And that's why I'm going to have barbecue for lunch. Because I'm not under the Torah. I live by the law of Christ. You say, what about murder? How, how, how do you not understand how that's answered in the love your neighbor as yourself? It all comes, what about adultery? You don't commit adultery when you love your neighbor as yourself. You don't, I don't need a whole list of laws. I can put it there. Moses gave the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. Matthew 5, 17. Moses made temporary atonement. Jesus made permanent atonement. Permanent atonement. Exodus 32, 30. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. An atonement. Jesus is the atonement. The ultimate atonement. Muhammad did nothing to make atonement. In fact, let me just be rude right now. Muhammad wasn't intelligent enough to know what the word atonement was all about. Atonement is a theological concept that God is pleased by something else to the point at which you can now be at one with God. That the animosity is removed. The debt is removed. The idea is like this. I owe Bill 50 bucks. And I've owed Bill 50 bucks for six months. And every week I tell him, I've got your money, I've got your money. Now what is that going to build up between the two of us? Animosity. Because I owe him money. And David steps in and says, I pay on Sean's behalf the 50 bucks. Now that the debt has been satisfied, Bill and I can now be at what? We can be at peace. At one meant. Atonement. 
That's the idea. That the enmity or the hostility that's created by the debt or the sin has been absorbed or paid for so that we can now be reconciled. There is nothing, let me say this again, there is nothing, nothing, nothing in the Islam faith, religion, I don't even like your word to use faith, that gives you any idea of atonement. You stand on your own two feet, you pay for your life according to how you live, and that's it. There's nothing that gives any idea of atonement. And that's the difference. On Mount Sinai, Moses' face shone. It shone. Remember that? He came down and they noticed his countenance was changed. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus' face shone like the sun. It's not an accident there that these things are intentionally put in the text. Did God have to make Moses' face shone? In anticipation for Jesus' face shown. That's why it's done that way. Like Moses, Jesus feeds thousands and f- thousands in the wilderness. Jesus does the same here with just about nothing. Jesus is better than Moses because he is the bread of life. Deuteronomy, ch- I'm sorry, John chapter 6. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, a reference to Moses, providing manna, and they're dead. Jesus goes on to say, this is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, is my body. Is my body. Moses got the bread from God. Jesus becomes the bread. Becomes the bread. Remember last week we saw, I've seen your affliction. Church, remember last week, I've seen your affliction, I've heard your cries, I know your sorrows, and I'm come down. Jesus intentionally says, I'm the one that came down. I came down. Muhammad can't say that he came down from somewhere. Joseph can't say he came down from somewhere. Joshua did not come down from somewhere. Only Jesus says, I came down from somewhere. I am the living bread that came down. Moses hit a rock and provided water. Jesus provides a well of water such that a man will never thirst again. Whosoever shall drink the water in John chapter 4, verse 14, that I give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Remember, church, I'm trying to overwhelm you. If you feel like this is overwhelming, that's very intentional. I could give you three of them and you could walk away going, okay, that's nice. But I'm trying to show you how many there are so that you're fully convinced that no one in the history of humanity is this much like Moses. Moses speaks for God in the Old Testament. Jesus speaks for God in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus said, Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Both are sent. Both are sent. Jesus said, If God were your Father, you would love me. Now look at this verse. If God were your Father, you would love me. The global narrative right now is that Yahweh and Allah are the same. That Jehovah and Allah are the same. That our God and their God is the same. That the God of the Mormons, that the God of the Jehovah Witnesses, that the God of Christianity, and that the God of Islam is the same God. I want you to see what this text says. This text says that if God were your father, so Muslim, if God is your father, you better love Jesus. Very clearly. If God were your father, you would love me. Why? For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. He sent me. So the bottom line up front is if you don't love Jesus, God is not your father. Let me be even clearer. If God's not your father, you're going to hell. So you better figure out, do I love Jesus this morning? 
guests and visitors, do I love Jesus? Is there any evidence in my life in these last seven days that I love Jesus? Have I sung to Jesus? Have I spoken to Jesus? Have I prayed to Jesus? Have I thought about Jesus? Have I read about Jesus? Because when you love something, there's evidence of it. Many of you love basketball, and there's nothing wrong with loving basketball. You're tracking basketball. You're looking at your brackets. How many of you, let's pause for just a moment and ask, how many of your brackets were destroyed when the Spartans fell this week? Raise your hand. Get them up there now. Hold them high. Just destroyed. Jeff, how, did you have a bracket or did you make one? Were you surprised by that? Yeah. When we love basketball, we pay attention to March Madness. We were in that whole food store where it takes your whole paycheck to be in there, yeah. up, up in Raleigh, Cary, okay? And this guy is like across the chicken. He's talking to his wife about the Michigan State game and how his bracket's destroyed. You know, and he wants her to take great interest in the fact that his bracket's destroyed. You know why? Because he loves basketball. If you love Jesus, there'll be some evidence this week that you did something with him. Like Moses, Jesus prophesied of a future tribulation for God's people. Deuteronomy 4.30, when thou art in tribulation, Matthew 24.21, then shall be great tribulation. Moses instituted the Passover. Jesus became the Passover lamb. Moses built a tabernacle for God. A tabernacle. He built a tabernacle. Jesus became the tabernacle. The word dwelt right there is literally tabernacled among you. This is very intentional. This is not an accident. Moses lifted up a bronze serpent to save people. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up. As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Both Moses and Jesus make intercession and mediate for God's people. Moses does it throughout the Old Testament over and over again. He goes to God on behalf of the Israelites and saves them from destruction. And Hebrews 7.25 says that Jesus lives and more to make intercession for you and I. Moses instructed 12 tribal leaders in Numbers 17, 6, and Jesus instructed 12 apostles. Moses sent out 12 spies, and Jesus sent out 12 apostles. I'm about ready to rest my case, church. Their lives are saved together in Egypt. They both have an adopted father. They're both sons of a king. Both turn water into something red parting water and walking on water, prophesying of tribulation. Both are sons of the true uh, Jacob or Israel. Both have Gentile brides. Both feed thousands. Both have brothers and sisters that reject them. Both make atonement. Both intercede and mediate. Both gave a law and fulfill, and Jesus fulfilled the law. Both were shepherds. Moses instituted the Passover. Jesus is the Passover. Both speak of future tribulation, first tribulation, then great tribulation. Moses brought bread down from heaven or received manna. Jesus became the bread. Both fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Both tabernacle and tabernacle among us. One built one, one did it. Both are sent by God. Both speak for God. Both had their faces shine. Both delivered people from slavery. Moses lifted up a servant and Jesus lifted himself up. Both instructed 12. Both sent out 12. One was the main character of the Old Testament. The other is the main character of the New Testament. Both forsook the glories of heaven in the palace of heaven. Now, I have a question for you. When you go to Chick-fil-A, which has one of the best milkshakes in town, and they say to you, would you like uh, the whipped cream and cherry on top? What do you typically do? I say yes, every time. I mean, 700 calories, what's another 50 more at that point, right? You know? All right, I'm going to give you the whipped cream and the cherry. Let's turn to the book of Revelation and we'll be done. I found this, I think, Friday, and I was overwhelmed by it. And I want to overwhelm you with it. And then we're going to pray. Would you turn to Revelation 15, please? And I'd like you to turn in your own Bible so that you can underline this because I think this is just amazing. Remember, I'm trying to prove the case that Jesus is the Deuteronomy 18:15 prophet. And we read in the book of Revelation in chapter number 15. And I saw another sign in heaven. I'm reading the first verse. I'm going to get to verse 3, but I'm reading the first verse. Chapter 15, the book of Revelation. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them filled up the wrath of God. 
And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Now please notice what they sing. They sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. That's not an accident. That's not an accident. Even the very last book of your Bible has information designed to show you that Jesus Christ is the Deuteronomy 18, 15 prophet. They sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Church, that's not an accident. I'm here to fully convince you that the Deuteronomy 18, 15 prophet is Jesus Christ. You're not making a mistake when you follow Jesus all the days of your life. And if you choose to forsake him, God will require it of you. Let's pray.